All right, and welcome to the third episode of Further Inquiry. Today, I'm joined by Melanie Sakoda. She is the administrator of a Facebook group called Orthodox Christian Sexual Abuse and also ran a website called Pokrov, which tracked abuse in both the Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches. She also works with Survivors Network over those abused by priests or SNAP. Melanie, how are you today? I am okay. I'm recovering um, from COVID, but I'm okay. <laughs> Well, sorry, sorry to hear about the COVID. I know I, I had it myself once. I know it's an unpleasant feeling, but let's jump right into it. Um, for our audience, can you explain a bit of your background? Like specifically, what got you interested in tracking the uh, uh, tracking the problem of abuse in the Orthodox Church and maybe also working with SNAP? Well, um, when I was attending a Russian Orthodox uh, Cathedral in San Francisco in the early 90s. And I've been at the parish for about 12 years. And we had a um, incident at our church um, and it involved a layman. Um, and he was accused of abusing um, ultimately about 10 children. Um, and the bishop handled it very poorly. And the children were really young, so it wasn't the children that came forward, it was the parents. And so we started thinking that, well, um, you know, if it's not a priest and it's parents coming forward and it's, you know, in, in real time, this is not a delayed disclosure and it can't be handled, what must it be like for um, people who are survivors and who are coming forward, you know, with a delayed disclosure? So we started a website um, with the idea of reaching out to those people. Um, and in, let's see, 2000, and we started the website in uh, 1999. And in 2008, uh, Barbara Blaine, who founded SNAP, reached out to, um, to us and to other groups that were working in the same area. Uh, SNAP was primarily a Catholic organization in the beginning and uh, invited us to a meeting in Chicago. And uh, my coworker, uh, Kathy Larson, went to the meeting and we started working with SNAP. Um, at that point in time, um, I began holding support meetings for local survivors in um, 2009. Um, I joined the SNAP board in 2016, and then I took a staff position with SNAP in 2019. Awesome, awesome. I know, I know, like, I'm um, probably hearing about like 10, 10 children being abused by that. That's, that's a horrific number, but even one is just horrific enough. But, um, well, that was like, pretty much all the children in the parish. I mean, Orthodox parishes are generally pretty small. I think it was all but maybe two children. Um, in the ah. parish. So it, it was a, it was, a small number in terms of the parish, but in, not an insignificant, or a small number in general terms, but not an, in a significant number in terms of the parish. Anyway, we digress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but like I'm getting in, getting in like into the uh, main it main issue of it here, like mainly like starting with like maybe some questions about like abuse and like a, like and cover up. Like in your own like personal opinion, how pervasive would you say is uh, sexual abuse within the Orthodox Church? You know, it's, I don't really have an answer for that question. None of the Orthodox churches have published any, um, they don't have lists of their abusers. They haven't published any statistics. Um, I will give the, the Catholic Church that. They have published statistics. I think they're sort of on the light side, but at least there's something as a base. Um, there's two sort of schools of thought. Um, one is that the Catholic Church has a bigger problem because its priests are celibate. Um, the other side of the coin is that we know that, in general, abuse is perpetrated by men who are in relationships with adult women, fathers, stepfathers, um, boyfriends. Um, so since Orthodox priests are married and are men who are in relationships with adult women, perhaps we have a bigger problem in the Orthodox Church. But at the current, current point in time, 
there's nothing to um, prove that one way or another. Have there been any attempts, like maybe, like to uh, like gather some data on on on, on the abuse rates? Like no, I, I, there's been no attempt in the ortho. I mean, it would have to come from the churches. I mean, uh, my website, while it was up, you know, had a certain amount of information, but basically, what I had was what was in the public domain: uh, news articles, um, you know, uh, statements maybe from churches or um, lawsuits. Uh, criminal uh, prosecutions, and that uh, that wasn't enough to form a statistically significant. Um, so this, I guess. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say. Like, I remember, like, seeing somewhere online. If I recall correctly, um, I think the Orthodox Church in America, the OCA. Uh, I think they once. I guess did a study on like abuse on rates of abuse within their own jurisdiction, but I guess from my understanding, they never uh, published the uh, the fi the findings. Uh, to, to I the was going to say I've never seen anything uh, about that. They may have um, done it. I know they had um, a lawsuit in. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, maybe 2008, and they made some significant changes um, in, in that year as a result of, of this lawsuit as a part of the settlement. Um, unfortunately, I think that um, from what I understand from cases that I know have gone to the OCA more recently, I don't think that the changes uh, made any significant dent in the way um, abuse cases were normally handled. Mm. Now, obviously, um, abuse, clerical abuse is probably, I, I would assume maybe like um, here in the West, like it's probably think of mainly as more of a Catholic problem. Do Orthodox lady and clergy like believe, like may, at least maybe some have a tendency to believe that clerical abuse and cover up is not so much a problem occurring within their own, um, within their own community? Oh, definitely. They think that because they have married clergy, you know, men with wives and children, um, that, you know, they're not going to have the same problem as the Catholic Church. And as I said, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I do know that married priests abuse, um, we have celibate um, clergy, you know, um, both priests and bishops. And abuse has been known in both those categories, both married priests and uh, um, priests that are supposedly celibate. Um, now, this is like a, like a, like a question like I've, I asked like a previous guest before, like I'm concerning the Catholic issue. Like, in your opinion, why do uh, the the hierarchy engage in cover up? I mean, what makes it just so, just so difficult to you know just do the right thing by calling the police? I think it's, in some ways, it's a human problem when you have groups of people. It's really hard to believe that the man you went to seminary with, um, that you know you may be friends with, that he would commit these kind of crimes. Now, unfortunately, what we know from studies is that false allegations of sex abuse, and particularly false allegations of child sex abuse, whether they're um, in real time or whether they're delayed are very seldom false. So that, um, and I don't know why we can't convince uh, the bishops that when you have one of these accusations, you need to take it seriously. You need to do outreach. You need to see if you can find out. You don't just sit on your thumbs and wait for people to come to you. You go to all the parishes where this person worked and you say, um, you know, we've had an accusation. You don't have to be real specific about it. You know, maybe you could say he's been accused by, you know, one person that he abused them when they were, you know, a child, a teen. Um, this person is male, female, you know, give some, some basic information. And then say, if you have any information about this, Here's the number of the, you know, if there's a police investigation, here's the number of the police that are investigating. Here's um, 
you know, um, if if it's an internal investigation that nothing's been reported to the uh, law enforcement, although the churches should be reporting to law enforcement when they get these accusations. And in many states in the U.S., they are, in fact, required to report. They are mandatory reporters. But in any event, if it's if it's something that's being handled within the church, then, you know, who to report to in the church so that when you have, in, you know, internal investigations, which probably should be handled by outside firms, not by um, people that may know these people. Um, but mm -hmm. then when you have an investigation, you have more data to deal with. You know, if you have one accusation um, by one person, um, in in general, in those cases, the al the allegation is considered unfounded or not credible or unsupported. Whatever whatever language they occurred at least. If you have four accusations against the same clergy, then I think you're you're looking at a case where this is likely something that happened. But in the past, they simply haven't. They have taken the side of the priest. Um, and uh, one Catholic whistleblower that I know of, he says he likens it to the idea that they've forgotten. They think of the church as being uh, the clergy, the building, the assets, you know, the, the icons, the chalices and everything. And it's not what the church is, is the community of believers. And that's what they should be protecting. And that's what they're not protecting. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Externals are, are, are really irrelevant. The, it's what the people that matter. Um, now, to your knowledge, has abuse cover-up even been committed by, by the Orthodox patriarchs themselves? Um, it's a little harder to talk about the, the patriarchs. I would say, you know, just as an informed opinion, I would say yes. But because um, I'm Sadly, um, English is my only language. Um, I've studied others, but English is the only language that I'm fluent in. Um, I don't know as much about abuse, say, in Greece or Russia or um, any of the other um, Slavic countries or in Turkey. Um, I, but I would suspect, you know, from what's going on in this country, I know that... Um, for example, when um, there was a, a priest accused in this country and it went, you know, back to the mother church in, in Europe, um, oftentimes they, they don't deal with it. They have, they have, they have um, removed some priests. Um, the Greeks removed uh, uh, Father uh, uh, Kaveos. I can't think of his first name at the moment. Sorry. Um, and, you know, others have been removed, but a lot of times it gets thrown back to, um, you know, they're either not going to remove him or in one case, they removed him from ministry, didn't defrock him. And so when the, um, that particular priest died, um, his victim, who thought she was okay with this, became very upset because there was this lavish clergy funeral and, you know, everyone was singing his praises and everyone forgot about her. Oh, man, that's that's truly shameful. But uh, hopefully, she she's able to heal. Um, now, in your um, in your experience, like what, like um, who would like probably be some examples of like of um Orthodox bishops that you that you are aware of, like who have like engaged in cover up? Um, cover up. I know that um. Off, hand, off the top of my head, I know that Metropolitan Jonah Pathhausen in the OCA was removed for covering up abuse. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, suppose the, it, also in the OCA, um, Archbishop Seraphim Storheim was removed for abuse. Um, and there's some indication that he covered up for other abusers, in, you know, probably because... Um, he was himself an abuser. Hmm. Have there been more, um, aside from that, like, had there been like multiple, many other cases of like, um, of bishops themselves actually being abusers? 
I believe there have, I know there have been some in Europe, I think in the, in the Greek church and um, in, I, for, I can't remember now whether that's a Sub Serbian or Bulgarian, or maybe it's both of them. There have been bishops in those three countries I know that have been removed for abuse. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy, I think, um, for an abuser to move up through the ranks. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, I, I remember someone telling me very early on that, well, yeah, they took him out of parish work because that way he wouldn't be as interacting as much with, with children. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me because then he'll be deciding cases um, where abusers are being brought to his attention. And what's he going to do then? Um, chances are he's going to protect the abusers. But um, I think it's it's just it's a it's a problem. You know, the Catholic and the Orthodox churches shared a thousand years of history, and the attitudes toward these cases um, started before the split. So that there is a um, um, a nexus where both churches react in much the same ways. That is, um, they tend to. Um, protect the priest, uh, um, denigrate the person who's coming forward. And um, unless there's, a, the thing that I think has really made a difference is um, public exposure. Um, I know in the Greek uh, Orthodox Church, you had the case of Father Nicholas Katinas. He was down in Dallas. He had been there for many years. He had been uh, transferred there from Chicago uh, where there were complaints about him abusing there. And then he was transferred to, to Dallas. And when the case came forward, um, he, he was sued, or he and the church was sued for abuse. And ultimately, um, six men came forward to accuse him of abuse, some from his Chicago days and some from uh, his parish in um, Dallas, including one person who was not a parishioner, but was a friend of the priest's son, and he was abused. They were supposed to go out trick-or-treating. He was at the priest's house, and he was abused by the priests then. So it's, you know, you have to wonder, if he had, if Katinas, Father Katinas had been removed when the abuse allegations are at least investigated, they had brought the uh, criminal charges, you know, they reported to the police, I think five of those six victims would not have been hurt. Mm. And I think um, that's, that's on the church. Absolutely. Um, so like based on like that, 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 um, that particular priest, like um, what did, did he um, commit abuse? Like when these, uh, when the uh, survivors, the victims, were they, uh, were they like still children at the time or were they yes. adult males? Oh, they were, so. these, these were all children. I mean, they may some of them may have been early teens, but they were under the age of majority. Yeah, because I, I was gonna say I was gonna ask, like in, in this case, maybe that was that priest like a like was he attracted to uh to prepubescent or like post pubescent uh um kids? Um now what would you say are probably some like the aside from that particular priest, like what would you say are probably some of the worst cases of abuse and cover up that you've probably heard about? I think one of the worst was actually, it's coincidentally, it's also out of Texas, was the, um, the uh, I think it was a Roker Monastery in um, uh, Texas, Blanco, Texas. And um, there was um, abuse allegations that first came forward, I think in 2006, and, or maybe it was earlier than that. Um, and the second round of, anyways, uh, two priests were at the monastery, the abbot, and another priest were accused of abusing uh, one minor. Um, they were both convicted. Um, so uh, the first priest, uh, the priest had a child, uh, ha uh, had, a, sorry, had a child, no, had a trial. The uh, abbot, um, after the first priest was convicted, uh, took a guilty plea. And you still had people saying, oh, you know, um, father, the fathers couldn't have done that. You know, it's the godless American legal system that 
um, you know, doesn't understand monasticism. Um, anyway, I think a, a number of years later in 2006, they had five of the monastics um, were accused of abuse. Um, the abbot who had been accused earlier and then uh, four additional men. Um, and uh, he made the, the Father Benedict, uh, Father's, um, I forget, yeah, Benedict Green may not have been um, the abbot at that point in time, but he was still at the monastery. And ultimately, all of them were convicted. Um, as I, all right, I'm not sure if Sam Green was, uh, uh, Benedict Green was convicted or if he committed, I know he committed suicide. I don't, don't remember now whether he committed suicide before or after he was convicted. But, and the monastery just basically folded. Um, that was the end of it. Um, they had since, when the first allegations came down, Roker um, uh, released them, but they continued sort of operating on their own. Um, they, you know, it's, which is much easier. It's, it's a little difficult to say you're a Catholic priest um, if you're not part of the Roman church or one of the um, Eastern Orthodox rites. It's very easy to say you're an Orthodox priest um, and not be attached to any of the canonical jurisdictions. You know, we had the same case with um, uh, uh, the so-called Archdiocese of Basilopolis in New York, um, where the head of the, um, the, the Metropolitan uh, uh, his name was Pungradios. Um, he was, in fact, he had in fact been a Greek Orthodox priest. He was convicted of child sex abuse in Pennsylvania and then went on to form his own jurisdiction. Um, and no one spoke out against it. You know, none of the Greek bishops called them on the fact. Um, they must have known that he had been convicted. They didn't say anything about it. And I don't understand, you know, I suppose they didn't want to get themselves into sort of a legal um, issue. But if he was convicted, I mean, we, uh, um, uh, my friends and I, we found the paperwork showing his conviction. And he, he, would, he had abused more than one minor. And uh, after the, um, his case was publicized on our website and some media picked it up, um, they had new victims come forward. Um, oh, wow. So, you know, and he had been, uh, I can't remember now how long, I think he had been going, operating as an independent Orthodox jurisdiction, you know, for um, maybe 20 years. So, you know, we, we don't do a very good job. One of the other things that we had suggested was that, you know, the there is, uh, used to be SCOBA, now it's called the Council of canonical bishops, assembly of canonical bishops, I guess, in, in the United States, um, that they become more proactive in telling people, okay, these people are fringe. They are not with the, you know, the GOA or the OCA or the Antiochian Archdiocese or any of the other um, groups. And, you know, and at least warning people that way because i think while you find abusers in um, mainstream canonical churches you are more likely to find them in the u.s you're more likely to find them in these little um, um independent orthodox, orthodox groups splinter groups yeah because you know that what do you do it's just like pangradios he was he was removed from the Greek priesthood, so he formed his own jurisdiction. Hmm. You know, it's not impossible to do that in this country. It may be harder to do in in Europe, although I think even in Europe there's, um, you know, the old calendar groups and the new calendar groups. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said, it's hard because I'm, I don't speak um, any language other than English, it's it's harder to follow uh, abuse back in the in Europe. But um, 
I'm I'm sure that the same is true of those groups that you're likely to you know the the main Orthodox churches that are under the you know that are connected to the ecumenical patriarch. Uh, there, you're going to find abusers there, but I think you're more likely to find it in the splinter groups. Um, and there's no it's not scientific. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, in your opinion. Which Orthodox jurisdiction probably has like the poorest record in terms of like handling abuse cases? Uh, I don't think any of them are particularly good. I think some of the uh, the the three biggest groups in the U.S. the canonical groups, anyways, the GOA, the OCA, and the Antiochians, did develop uh, sex abuse pol policies so that they supposedly had some sort of a background. So the the Serbian Church, um, the um, the Bulgarians um, that aren't part of the OCA, um, they they I think maybe I guess the Bulgarians I think have a sex abuse policy too. Um, I think Metropolitan Joseph developed one, but I think you're likely to find in the in the groups that are. Um, have not been as much in the public eye. You know, you've had a uh, publication of uh, Greek cases, you've had publication of Russian cases, um, you've had publication of Antiochian cases. Some of the others have slid under the radar. Um, and that's one of the problems with focusing attention on these issues, because for a lot of the media, you know, if you, if you, they don't realize that although orthodoxy is divided jurisdictionally, it is the third major Christian faith in the United States. You know, if you put everyone together, if, you know, the OCA ever realizes dream of becoming the Orthodox Church of America, um, you know, they would all be under one roof, under one jurisdiction, but they're not. They're all, they're all divided. They're divided by language culture they're divided by calendar and you know people look at it um, it's just too little the the katinas uh, nicholas katinas case and the blanco monastery case did make some uh, uh, splash in the press there was the the priest in um, uh, new york um, who was um, uh, caught on video with his his mistress um, you know that made a, a, of course a splash in the in the media um, but by and large it's hard to get media attention to the orthodox cases hmm. now you mentioned that uh, 1000 year shared history i've been told by by a catholic um psychotherapist that there are canons like dealing with uh, sexual abuse going back as far as the uh, fourth century. What would you say is probably the oldest case of abuse that you've heard about? Meaning like what year did it, did it occur? Like maybe like the early 20th century, 19th century or something like that? Yeah, I think the earliest case that we heard about, you know, as, as far as I remember was like maybe from the eight, um, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and there was some, you know, it, it, I, well, I found a news article about it, so it made some, uh, um, impact in the media of the day, but of course it would have been confined. Um, one of the things that, you know, while the internet is kind of a blessing and a curse, one of the things that it means is that you can't have a priest to abuse in California and transfer him to New York and think that people aren't going to find out about it. Now, that used to be possible, um, you know, because you would have to, um, you know, uh, criminal cases are going to be, you have to go to the, the county where the criminal conviction took place to look up the conviction. Um, but if it's in the media now, you Google the name and, you know, it might pop up, which is one, one of the tricks, of course, that some of them do is they change the spelling of their name. That is one drawback of the internet. You know, you'll find people um, Americanizing their name or um, just so it won't show up in a, in a Google search. Mm -hmm. But in general, it's a lot harder 
for people to um, get away with that now. And when we had our website, we would always include all the different uh, names that the clergy went by. So it would it would pull up no matter what name um, the people were trying to Google. You know, of course, I'm sure some of them kept ahead of us. But as I said, in the in these days of the internet and you know social media, it's a lot harder for people who have been publicly accused of abuse to be transferred someplace, to be quietly transferred someplace else. Now they still do it, um, but it's harder. Um, particularly, as I said, if there has been some kind of public exposure in the media. Hmm. Um, where, where was I? Um, now going on over to uh, survivors, um, actually, no, not, not now I remember what I was going to ask. Like, have you had, uh, like, like elderly survivors, like, maybe come to you, like, saying, like, you know, that they were maybe abused, like, maybe, say, back in, like, like the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, or, so, or something like that? I can't remember that. Specifically, Orthodox survivors that were um, that old. Or uh, I did have, when we first uh, put our website up, I had someone... Um, uh, write to me, and their daughter had been abused in an Orthodox church. It was someplace in the Midwest, and uh, um, he he said, you know, um, I guess his daughter's case was not handled very well, and this was an older case, you know, that was in the early 90s, and I think his daughter was abused in the 50s or the 60s, and uh, he said they didn't handle it well, and uh, he told me not, uh, you know, at that time we were still trying to get attention to the, uh, the case, the San Francisco case that spurred us to form a web, form our website. And he says um, it was, and that was, a, it was an OCA cathedral, and he said, don't expect anything from the OCA. Well, and uh, he was right. No. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, other than I will have to say, someone reminded me of this the other day that I was talking to. Um, one of the first Orthodox sex abuse policies came out of of that um, incident at the church in San Francisco. Um, that was the OCA's first sex abuse policy that was formed in the early '90s. Um, they've since have upgrades, as I said, after the, the one lawsuit they faced, they did a significant upgrade. And on paper, their their policy is, is not bad. Um, there's still, as in most of the church's policies, um, there's a lot of discretion for the bishop, which means that even if, say, the, um, you know, who's ever investigating on behalf of the church comes back with, yeah, we think this happened, the bishop can still override them. And I think that's something that um, people in the pews should be looking at. You don't want that, um, uh, you know, and I know some people give the old saw, you know, well, innocent till proven guilty, and they're talking about, you know, a criminal conviction. Well, the fact of the matter is criminal cases, number one, are subject to statute of limitations. And a lot of times when people come forward, they're already past the statute. They can't have a criminal prosecution. And secondly, that churches don't need um, a criminal um, conviction in order to remove a priest. The churches have absolute control over who represents them in ministry. So if they have reason to believe that someone is an abuser, they are perfectly within their rights removing them, whether or not there's been a criminal conviction. And unfortunately, you know, if you can get the case out in the public, they sometimes do that. Um, you know, Nicholas Katinas was removed without a criminal conviction. Hmm. Um, but, um, you know, you have to get the story out to the public or they're just, you know, um, and I tell people they don't always listen to me and that's okay. I didn't listen to my, I didn't follow my own advice when when oh, we were uh, talking about what had happened at the church in San Francisco. We went to the church first, um, but 
um, you can, you know, if, if what has happened is a crime, go to the law enforcement first. And then if you want to, go to the church. But make sure that you try to get it outside of the um, uh, ecclesiastical channels. You want it to be, um, you know, either um, go to law enforcement if you can. Um, and if you can't do that, you know, file a lawsuit if you can. And, you know, reporting directly to the church should be your last option and only if it's the only thing that you can do and if there's some way you can um, get the media interested in your story like if there's a, a big enough group of survivors of the same clergy um, then then do that first the ch reporting to the church in my view should always be the last resort because chances are they're not going to do anything and you're going to be disappointed and hurt Mm. Now, moving on to the question specifically about survivors, have survivors described to you how the abuse they endured, like, affects, like, their own daily lives? Like, do they, like, for example, like, have, like, difficulty with relationships? Um, that's, I mean, I work with a lot of survivors now. Um, I hold, um, I think, five support groups a month, um, one for Orthodox survivors. And yes, I mean, that's, that's all true. Um, survivors, uh, particularly those who are abused as children, but adult survivors as well, are prone to um, substance abuse. Um, they are prone to um, uh, a lot of autoimmune problems because they're um, of the fight or flight response that gets uh, triggered. It's um, kind of always on. Um, and there, there are a lot of, of thing, relationship problems are another thing because um, one of the, uh, the side effects of clergy abuse is you become to, you, you don't know who to trust. This was a man you were told was trustworthy that you may have trusted, you may have had love and they betrayed your trust. So who, who do you trust? It's, it's really hard to get around that. And um, one snack later um, describes working with survivors like trying to herd wounded cats because you do get a lot of that reaction. You know, they don't necessarily trust you when you're holding these support groups. Um, you know, it takes a while for that uh, trust to develop. And in some people, it never fully develops. It's, it has lifelong repercussions and that are very difficult to, um, they're difficult to treat. And you have to find someone who's trauma informed, who knows what trauma survivors need to heal. And you have to get to the point where you either, some, some survivors don't remember their, particularly child survivors don't remember their abuse. So you have to get to the point where you remember it or alternatively, sometimes people won't always know their abuse but won't understand that the relationship problems, the physical problems, the problems with holding jobs, again, you know, um, the lack of trust, the distrust of authority um, has impacted their lives. And once you get to that, then that's the point where you can start healing. And the first thing is, is telling someone, um, you know, maybe a trusted friend, maybe a relative, maybe a, a group like SNAP. But the idea is that the first step on the road to healing is acknowledging that you were abused and telling, being able to tell someone about it. Now, you do have to be careful because not everyone is a safe person to talk to about this. You know, people will say unhelpful things like, oh, that, you know, you were abused 40 years ago. Get over it. And this isn't something that you, you get over. This is, and for survivors, it's not something that's in the past. It's something that affects their day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, if you know a survivor, if you've been told by someone that they were abused, number one, believe them. Number two, you know, ask them if there's anything that you can do to help them. But just believing them is a big step um, 
in their healing process because they'll begin, oh, this person believed me. And that's why support groups are really helpful because people sometimes think they're the only ones, um, you know, unless they know of other survivors, but they may think, you know, what did I do that made father do that to me? Um, and that's, that's a way for a child to assert control. You know, what did I do? So what can I, what can I do in the future so as not to be abused? Unfortunately, some of the things that children develop in response do not become particularly helpful when they become adults. Um, so that's why they need to, you need to have people acknowledge what happened to them themselves and you need to have them getting professional help. And some people say that actually talking to, to their peers, you know, peer to peer support groups are even more helpful than therapy. Um, depends on, on where you are, I guess, in the healing process and, and what kind of damages you have. But certainly, um, sometimes people need um, medication, you know, anti anxiety medication, um, maybe um, sometimes abuse triggers um, uh, more serious psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, bipolar, um, and those may, you know, may need medication. So, um, you know, you need to know what you need um, and you need to figure it out and you need, you need to have the courage to do it. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember um, that Catholic psychotherapist I mentioned, like he, when I interviewed him, he, he quoted uh, another uh, expert in this field. Like he, he described like um, child sexual abuse as quote unquote soul murder, which yes. I think is a, is a very, um, correct term to use in this particular case because it it's quite literally damaging their the essence of who they are in my opinion well, um, I mean, all sex abuse is damaging um but when you have it by someone and particularly i think in the catholic churches and the uh, the, the sacramental churches where the priest in, in some aspects during the the liturgy represents god then it also affects your spiritual life, which I think is why, um, you know, um, people refer to it as soul murder. And the truth of the matter is, and I, maybe this is another question you had, but uh, most survivors uh, sever their relationships with the, the church where they were abused. A, a, a very small handful are able to maintain it. Um, some go on to other religions, either radically different um, or, you know, um, and I don't mean just Protestant, but, you know, like maybe they become Buddhists or they become Muslim, like Muslim. Yeah. Um, but very, very few of them are going to the, the vast majority is to any kind of organized religion. Um, they just don't trust it anymore. And in this and context, and in this context, you're referring specifically like to uh, the Orthodox survivors you've worked with. Um, that's true for the Catholic survivors as well. Mm. Yeah, I was I was gonna ask like um you you were, since you already mentioned like if uh, um, essentially I was gonna ask if uh, survivors tend to leave the church like for those who have left, I guess like I guess from what you describe it sounds like they experience a crisis crisis of faith. Um, do some also like turn like to some form of like air religion, mean like atheism or agnosticism as well? Oh, I think um, the, probably the majority of survivors, um, as I said, lose lose all kind of faith. They may still sort of have a spirituality, particularly um, you know those who have sub substance abuse problems, problems, and may go to AA or NA, you know, and the the idea of the higher power. So they may have some sort of a spiritual concept, but you're not going to find these people in in religions. I mean, some of them, um, it becomes difficult even to go to family functions, you know, weddings, um, funerals. You know, I've heard Orthodox people tell me, you know, that their family was mad at them because they, they went, they went to go to their grandmother's funeral, but when they went, stepped inside the church, it, it was all too triggering for them. So they had to leave and the family was really mad. Um, and I think, you know, um, 
I think that's what you're going to find. That it just becomes too hard, especially because if it happened in the church, um, because the the icons, the the incense. Uh, particularly smells can be very triggering for survivors. Um, and they're usually one of the one of the things that's, you know, if, if people don't remember their abuse, a smell is one of the things that's likely to bring it back. You know, either if it's the incense or if it's the aftershave that their abuser wore. Um, these memories can be triggering. So people avoid, you know, you, you don't want to feel like that. Um, and so you avoid it. And in the case of the Orthodox churches, because it's really like, you know, the Greek church, if you're most of the people who go to the Greek church are Greek. So you cut yourself, you're cut off from your community as well, um, which is um, sad. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the, matching, the matching, hatching, and dispatching. Yeah, I was actually going to ask, like, um, where where is it like like do survivors like tend to be ostracized from the communities that they grew up in because I, I would assume that maybe orthodox communities are probably tight knit like correct me if i'm wrong yeah i mean i th and they're smaller you know um you don't have like in the and maybe some of the, some of the greek and i think antiochian parishes can be pretty big but in my experience most of the russian parishes are fairly small and that's one of the other problems with trying to come forward, because if you have, if you're in a, a Catholic church where they have five masses every weekend and, you know, 200 people at each mass, if you come forward, it may not be obvious. If you come forward in an Orthodox church, chances are people in the parish are going to know who you are. And one of the things that, that happens is, I, and I personally I think it's kind of a self-protective device, that people think that you, you must be lying because if you're not lying, then it could happen to, to their children. It, it could happen to their grandchildren. And people don't like to think about that. They want to trust their clergy, which is one of the reasons why uh, predators um, are attracted to churches. They know people have their guard down. They know if, you know, if they're in a position of authority, they have that built-in trust. And it's going to be really hard for, for, to move that dial from, you know, uh, a, you know, he's, he's a priest. He's, he had hands laid on him, you know, so he's, he's been, you know, the Catholics actually have a, a word for it you know, that there's, there's been a change, but it doesn't change. If, if you're an abuser before you become ordained, you're going to be an abuser after you're ordained. You know, the church may be mystical. It's not magic. It can't change people like that. Um, and that's why, um, you know, there should be um, more emphasis placed on who who they are dating and in that case the orthodox are lucky because because they allow married priests you have a bigger pool of um, a men to pick from from uh, but you have to be careful if someone showed some signs of you know inappropriate behavior in the seminary then he shouldn't be ordained um, and you know if you don't find out about it until he's he's already been in a parish you need to act swiftly and and surely to get him out of ministry so that other people aren't hurt. If you care about people coming to the church, you know, all these survivors that are lost, you know, um, are they not worthy of care? You know, I mean, you can, um, I, I personally, I don't know, I've never understood it and I don't think I ever will. I don't see why you wouldn't protect your your faithful and particularly the most vulnerable among your faithful, the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was going to like ask like um, you know, it's been reported to me like um, but by, by it's been reported to me like you know in the Catholic Church like some survivors, if not maybe most, like um, are like simply given a check without any offer of additional help. Like has the same or is maybe something similar like occurred within the Orthodox Church, like where. Uh, 
like maybe like the allegations were were, were credible, but um, the like the bishop or whoever the case may be, like just just like you know, gave him a check and said, "All right, get out of my office." Um, you know, as I said, the, the or what happens in the Orthodox churches is more secretive than, what, than um, I think what's happened in the Catholic. The Catholic Church has been such a spotlight put on about it, and particularly, um, you know, if you look at the uh, Boston Globe expose in uh, 2002, you know, they put a lot of emphasis on the, that people were, were given checks, that they were, um, you know, made to sign non-disclosure agreements so that they never talked about what happened. And I, you don't have as much information about that. As I said, you know, um, to the media, um, the Orthodox are a bunch of little ethnic churches. Um, they don't think of them as, you know, uh, basically, um, and I get a lot of <laughs> questions about this sometimes, you know, if, if you're Russian Orthodox, you can go into a Greek Orthodox church and it's going to be different. It's going to be different music and, you know, um, I know the, the Greeks tend to like their organs too, but basically it's the same liturgy. You can follow along, you know what's happening. And, you know, if you get permission from the priest, you know, you have cross communion. So it really is, it, it is the third major Christian faith in the U.S. And that's not widely recognized. Um, I actually, um, was working on a um, media release, and I wanted the, <laughs> um, I wanted to say that because I think that something, uh, if we want to um, put more focus on the Orthodox churches in order to address this problem of, of clerical sex abuse, you need to get um, that the cases out in the public eye. That's the mm -hmm. only. That's the only thing that really makes the bishops. Held accountable. Yeah, makes them move. <laughs> now, yeah, they like, don't like it when they're in the press. Mm -hmm. Now, in your experience, do survivors tend to be mostly male or female, or is it maybe evenly distributed? I think um, if, um, you know, according to like SNAP's, SNAP's membership, it may be a little more slanted toward male survivors, but Part of that you have, you if you think about it, is um, male priests generally have more access to male um, victims. You know, they're altar boys. You know, the priest can say if there's a, a you know families in in the church with single mothers. Oh, how about if I take the boys on a camping trip? No one's going to think too much about it. If you want, if and one of the reasons why, as I said, it's not. It's not entirely clear to me which way, whether there'll be more abuse or less abuse in the Orthodox Church, is if you have a priest that has children, and maybe he has girl children, he can say, oh, um, why doesn't, you know, Sarah come over to play with Emily? You know, so in the Orthodox churches, you may have more more of an even thing but there's nothing statistical to back to back that up and i think the 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 vast majority of victims and this is something when we put up our website we weren't really expecting there are a lot of adult women who are victimized by clergy um, adult men too but particularly adult women and mm. their um their testimony is generally discounted. Oh, you know, what did you do to make father do that? So um, victim blaming. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, with, with men, it's a little more difficult because the Orthodox Church, like the Catholic Church, um, doesn't view homosexuality as an, as an option. Um, so if a priest is preying on another man or on a boy, um, that becomes more... Um, uh, something that may produce a bigger response. If if the priest is preying on a, a woman or even sometimes teenage girls, um, it's like, oh, you know, they came on to father and poor man, he just couldn't resist. 
you know. Um, he's a, he's only a man after all. Um, mm. and, and I think it's a shame. I think that, um, and I do know that when SCOBO put out a sex abuse policy a number of years ago, one of the things that it said in there, and it said it very well, was that in terms of the parishioners, there, the priest is he's the father. So no one is truly um, um, able to, you know, um, if, the, if the priest does something, people tend to be in shock, you know. Um, I know, I, I remember one man who was abused in a, in a seminary saying that when the, when the priest that abused him um, started, he was so shocked he couldn't move. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind. You know, there's fight and flight, but there's also freeze. And a lot of um, survivors in in religious situations, that's what they do if their their priest assaults them. Um, particularly if it's an assault kind of out of the of the blue. Sometimes with grooming, a different dynamic comes in where, um, oh, father showed me porn, and then he puts his hand on my thigh, and then you know he does something else, and the the victim starts to feel complicit. Um, and particularly if they really cared for the priest. And a lot of the priests target um, um, people from um, broken families, particularly where there's just, uh, you know, the mother has charge with the kids. So, and they want that, you know, male influence on their children. Um, but they can, you know, and they can feel if they're groomed by the priest. And in fact, the priest grooms the whole family, you know, um, the parent as well as uh, the children to accept things that they shouldn't be accepting. And it's very, it's very, very, very difficult for survivors who felt that they loved their, their abuser, um, whether they're male or female. Um, now, you know, oh, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, if, if someone just plain out assaults you, you know, um, you, you know, there's not the same relationship built up. If, you, if you're groomed, um, you know, you've gotten something out of this relationship. You know, he took you for ice cream. He took you to the movies. You know, he listened to your problems. Um, something that you weren't mess maybe getting at home. Then it's once the assaults begin, it's a little diff difficult to extract yourself and to extract your mind from the relationship that this you loved this man. Now, when the abuse um, for for survivors, when the abuse occurred, um, did they do they usually report to you like um, or to law enforcement if um, they were prepubescent or postpubescent at the time? Because in the Catholic Church, like um, from what I, from my own understanding, like um, most most uh, survivors te tend to have been um, postpubescent males. Like I wonder, I'm wondering, you know, what is it a bit different, or is it similar in the Orthodox Church? In, well, as I said, it's hard to say because even in the Catholic Church. Um, uh, SNAP has always suspected that the the women survive the you know women who were abused as either teens or children are undercounted, you know. And in in the SNAP uh, database, the the male and female survivors are per, pretty evenly distributed. And as I said, the difference may account for um, the fact that the priests are male, and you know if you're priest wants to take your son on an outing or have him come, you know, go on a camping trip, you might not think too much of it. If he wants to take your daughter on a camping trip, yeah, not, not as likely, as I said. Although in Orthodox cases, you may have more of that because the priest may have daughters of his own. Um, but I've now and I've totally lost track of what you what you asked me. <laughs> I'm um, sorry, I, I, I still I, have a little I, bit of COVID brain. <laughs> I, I, I was asking, like, um, like, like, for, I guess for survivors that you've personally worked with, like, um, 
were they prepubescent or postpubescent at the time that they were abused? I think um, probably more of them were um, postpubescent, but some of them were on the cusp. I think 11 years old, um, at least in the Catholic um, studies, 11 years old tends to be, you know, the age. So that they're sort of on the cusp. You know, uh, some 11 year olds look like men. Some 11 year olds look like kids. Um, so it's really difficult to say. And I think as, as a child gets older, they are more likely to be involved as altar boys or um, in other activities that bring them in closer proximity to the priest. Um, and plus, you know, uh, uh, I suppose um, people who are, are, well, I guess, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. A lot of people think um, that um, this is about sexual attractive, attraction, but abuse is not about sex, it's about power and control. And I think why you tend to find um, more boys and, and more um, adolescents abused in the Catholic Church is because the, the priest had more access to those people. And it was just, it could have been anyone. Uh, I know one of my uh, friends uh, uh, was abused by a Catholic priest. She's a woman. She was abused by a Catholic priest. Um, she's, most of his victims were males. She is one of two of the whole group of, of victims, she is only one of two girls that were abused by the same priest. So, you know, if if you look at him, he's gonna he's most likely going to be, uh, you know, accused as abusing. And I think most of his victims were were you know that 11, 12, 13 kind of range. But that wasn't all that he did because it's not about who he wants to have sex with is about exercising that power and control over another human being. And she just happened. He was, you know, he, her, he, I guess, groomed her family. He came to um, their house. He abused her in her own house um, and in the church too, I believe. But, you know, it's, I don't, you know, I don't think, um, and one of the reasons that they sometimes put, priests who um, abuse adolescents back into ministry is because they can basically teach this person to check birth certificates. But is there that much difference between abusing, a, say, a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old? 18-year-old may be, may be legal in some states. Um, but abuse is still abuse. <laughs> It's still it's still abuse, but it may not be something that's actionable, which is all that you know. Which is what the church more cares about, because if it's not something that's criminal, um, if the person is groomed, so it's not just an out and out sexual assault. Um, you know, most law enforcement isn't going to do anything about it unless there are laws on the books, and there are in some states that say any sex between a clergy and a parishioner is a crime. Um, California has just this year introduced a bill to make it a, make that a crime in California. Um, and that there are 13 states that have laws that, um, 13 states and I think the District of Columbia that currently have laws on the books like that. But if you're not in one of those states and you're you're groomed and then you know um, the priest has sex with you when you're 18, that's not going to be considered a crime. Um, now the church should still pay attention to it because what's to say the the priest doesn't get sloppy and start assaulting minors again? Um, and there are, I, I remember one, and this is a Greek Orthodox case, I'm kind of remembering, um, where the priests, they knew he was abusing adult women. Um, and they just kept keeping him in ministry, passing along. Because, of course, it was this woman, the, the women's fault, you know. Um, and he finally assaulted a 12-year-old, 12 12-year-old 12 girl. 
and that's when he, um, you know, her parents found out, her parents reported to the police, he was convicted, he was um, ultimately defrocked. Um, but that's, that's a little bit rarer. Um, but it does mean that, you know, if someone's abusing teens or adults, you should pay attention. Because as I said, this is not about sex, this is about availability. And if a, a younger person, a person of a different sex comes across their paths and they think they can get away with it, they will abuse that person too. Now, have you personally had any contact with survivors outside North America? Like, and if so, like, you know, where are these like survivors typically located? Like I personally have like, a, I've, I contacted a uh, former Serbian Orthodox deacon, um, Perhaps you've heard of him, Bojan jo Jovanovic. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 Um, like, have you like had has spoken with any survivors outside the U.S.? Well, <laughs> as I said, one of the problems is I only speak English. So if they speak English and they contact me, I've I've heard from them. Um, I do know. Um, um, I'm trying to think. I, I'm not remembering any um, uh, any um, survive contact with survivors from Europe, other than maybe uh, some Greek people I know from from Greece. And um, there may be have been some Russians too, but it's limited because of my language limitations. Um, and while most people in other countries are are better about um, having children learn a second language than we are in the U.S. Um, that's a limit, can be a limitation for other people too, that they, you know, they can't talk to me because I only speak English and, uh, um, you know, I can't talk to them because I don't speak any, um, um, I don't speak Greek, I don't speak any of the Slavic languages, um, so it's difficult. But if, if they found our, their, our website, people contact us. But it has been just as the, the same is true with SNAP. Most of it, it was um, abuse within the US. Uh, now, how often do survivors like maybe come to you and report that they were abused by a Claire? Like, do you like get this like every week, every month, something like that? Well, I've had. Um, <laughs> Um, I, pro I think I've had uh, like two Orthodox cases come up in the last year, you know, as, as I said, and, and because I don't have my website anymore, I probably, you know, um, don't always don't hear from Orthodox survivors other than perhaps who, um, who heard of me um, before the website went down or, um, and, but most of them are coming to SNAP, um, you know, because we do, uh, we do, um, actually I take that back. We had three cases this year, um, all adults, um, two in the Greek church and one in the OCA. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's steady. It's not, you know, I, I hear more often from Catholic survivors or, you know, actually, um, you know, or from various Protestant um, denominations. But the Orthodox are there. Um, as I said, some of them, I think, don't come forward because they, they're, they think no one's going to believe them because um, Orthodox priests are married. Ergo, there isn't a problem in the Orthodox churches. Now, if they've been paying attention, they could see the big expose. I think that the I think it was a Houston Chronicle did on the Southern Baptist Convention, and there again, you have married married clergy, um, and you have abuse. You know, it doesn't protect. And yeah. truthfully, I think most parishioners will be better off um, when when they take their children to church having the same eye on them that they would at a public play playground. Um, just because someone is in church doesn't mean he's there like you are to worship God. 
He may be there because churches are prime hunting grounds for predators. Now, when a survivor um, reports abuse, like, um, in, or rather, the survivors that you've worked with, have they, like, say, said to you, like, you know, they were maybe, like, were they bullied or were they harassed by the, by other clergy, by the parishioners, by the bishops, etc.? Well, I think one of the best examples, and it's, it's actually out there in, in the media, was um, in the Katina's case, the... The first two survivors to come forward, one was a, a Ukrainian um, boy. I, well, he was a man at the time he came forward, but he, you know, he he was Ukrainian and he had been attending the church in Dallas where he was abused, and um, one of the men from Chicago. Um, and when they first came forward, one of the Greek women in the parish said. <laughs> He's he's not Greek. He's probably lying. And the, with the idea that his ethnicity mattered, as opposed to him being a child and an Orthodox child going attending a parish, and um, the kind of the beneficial side effect of that happening was that um, people who were also abused got angry and started coming forward. Um, you know, the the child that I mentioned that was abused because he was going trick-or-treating with the priest's son. He read that. He was totally angry, and he was, like, the next person to come forward. So it's, you know, I think you have to, it, it's hard to come, harder to come forward in Orthodox communities because it's more likely that they're going to figure out who you are and it's more likely that people are going to find some way to discount what you're saying. You know, um, either it's, oh, you know, um, sometimes people will say, well, that that child has a drinking problem or, or, you know, a drug problem. And it's like, well, yeah, but that could also be a symptom of abuse, not a reason that they're making this up. And, you know, you find people saying really hurtful things. And until you get, if you're the first person to come forward, it can be really hard. Um, this, you know, once the first person has come forward, the second, third, fourth, fifth person, they have a much easier time because there's other accusations out there. And as I said, you know, um, people don't think about the fact that false allegations are extremely rare. But once there's more than one allegation, they start thinking about, Hmm. You know, especially if they're from different times and, you know, they don't know each other, uh, different periods of the, the priest's history, maybe different parishes. You know, you start to wonder um, or you should start to wonder. But anyways, people don't always people. Um, I was at a, a snap um, media event a few months ago and this woman stopped her car and starts shaking her finger at her. You don't accuse priests. And it's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, we didn't respond to her. What can you say to someone that's that convinced? But the fact of the matter is, even if they're accused, I mean, you know, even if you know that that's what they did, um, it doesn't make that that reliance on the infallibility of the clergy that you know basically they're next to god um has never really made a whole lot of sense to me but it's certainly after all these years of doing what i do it doesn't make any sense to me now priests do abuse and as a matter of fact um as i said before studies have shown that um, predators like churches because people trust you. People think you're there for the same reason that they are. And it gives you an advantage. Um, now, um, going back to the issue of abusers, what would you say probably, you know, causes these men to commit their abuse? Like, do like they have like maybe trouble backgrounds? Do they have mental health issues? Um. 
I mean, and this is, again, this is, I don't think this is anything scientific. I think that basically what you're looking at is sociopaths, people who have no conscience, people who are missing something in their their background that doesn't allow them to emphasize with, em, emphasize with other people. And they just want what they want. You know, they like the idea of power and control. Um, and so they take it and they subject other people to it. And, you know, it's good for them. So it doesn't matter if it's not good for them. They may not even notice. Um, that it's not good for them. Um, do some of them, you know, supposedly, particularly, particularly when they're on trial for, um, you know, criminal charges, they'll talk about, oh, I was abused when I was a kid too. Um, but I don't know if there's a, a correlation between uh, abuse and abuser. I know that a lot of survivors, um, that's something that they worry about. That's one of the things that why they don't tell people. But the fact of the matter is, is that most survivors do not become abusers. So there's something in the person that does become an abuser, if they were abused. Uh, there's something, something missing in them. Now, children do sometimes, um, if they're abused, do sometimes um, do reenactments. They, you know, use their toys or they, you know, do things to re as a way of trying to understand it. And sometimes, um, you know, um, they may abuse other children. But I think what you find is that those people who are going to go on to become abusers, that this isn't just a way of trying to um, wrap their heads around what happened to them, they enjoy it. It gives them a feeling of power and control. Most of the other people who um, are just gonna say, oh, I didn't like that. It made me feel really bad. I felt really bad about what I had done. And they, you know, they don't do it again. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, you want to get children, you want to find out that children were abused. You want to get them into treatment um, so that, you know, they, they understand better so they don't hurt other children inadvertently um, in trying to figure out what's going on with them. But the more important point is that most people who are abused do not grow up to become abusers. Quite the opposite. Right. Now, uh, the, um, the Orthodox Church obviously allows for uh, married men to become priests. Um, and you're like anecdotally, I guess, like from what you have seen or for what um, survivors have reported to you. Were the abusers like usually married? Were they celibate, or were like there cases of like both types like committing abuse against the survivors you've worked with? Yeah, I mean it's both types. Sometimes you know, um, um, some of the married men um, use their wife and child, if you will, as a beard, as a disguise. Um, and I don't know how many clergy wives I've I've of abusers that I've heard from. So you have the one thing you do have in the Orthodox Church that you don't have in the Catholic Church is you don't have wives and children as being uh, victimized by the priests. You do have that in Orthodoxy. You know, you have priests abusing their own children, priests abusing other children, um, and then you have you. you I, I don't know. I would I would almost say that it's probably evenly divided between um, priests that married priests and celibate priests. Um, and and on both sides, some of the celibate priests um, abuse boys. And again, I don't know if that's because they have more access to the boys or that's their their preference. But um, you know, you have there was the case of the Greek Orthodox uh, bishop um, who abused the priest's daughter. I mean, she was I think she was an adult, but she was very young, and. Um, You know, it, it it just it just depends. You know, he had access to her, um, and he abused her. And uh, her father was kind of unsuccessful in getting. I think he continued as a 
I, I, they sort of took him out of the main line of authority, but he remained a bishop, I think, until his death. Um, and you have to wonder how many other victims he had. Um, there was a, and he was, there was a big article about him in, in uh, People magazine of all places, the Black Prince of the Church. Hmm. Well, wow. that's, 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 that's a shame. Do you want to look it up? <laughs> I could probably look it up. Like, um, once this is all over, like, um, like, I guess this is probably the most important question. I don't recall if I asked. Like, what, like, specifically, like, needs to change, um, in the Orthodox Church, like, to help put an end to the issue of abuse and cover up. I think first thing, the people in the pews have to wake up realize it does happen in their churches, uh, be alert to it. I think um, um, they have to um, uh, be more um, uh, um, open with their children. I, I remember at one point in time we were working, I think it was a Roker church, um, and um, there were some children that were trying to focus attention on abuse and they had people, oh, we're not going to tell our children about sex, you know? Um, and it's like, you, you're leaving them unprotected. Some of them, you know, some of the, especially the younger kids, if you don't, if they don't have some idea, and I mean age appropriate, you know, but if they don't have some idea of what they should allow and what they shouldn't, you know, um, I think the simplest way is say, you know, no one should be touching you other than maybe a doctor, you know, in the parts of your body that are covered by your bathing suit. Very simple. Sorry. Uh -huh. And you have to prepare your children. And then you have to make sure. Yeah. Bless you. I were you sneezing. No. Uh, you know, it's just a stupid COVID cough. Okay. Um, then you have to make, you know, you have to be willing to call the bishops to account. Um, there was an article that I was reading today about a Catholic bishop. I can't remember where now. Oh, I think Missouri someplace. And he put a priest who had been accused of abuse, but he had been cleared by the church, put him back in the ministry in a parish with the school. And the parents were absolutely appalled, and the bishop came. And uh, the article was kind of interesting, because not only were the parents saying, you know, maybe he didn't abuse this, this um, child that he was accused of abusing, but you want us to trust our children in this situation and the parents weren't necessarily willing to do it and i think that's what needs to happen in the orthodox parishes too i know there's um, one priest that's still op or there's several priests in the um, greek orthodox church that are still operating and they've been accused of abuse it's like why do you want that <laughs> Why do you want that liability? You know, the, the Orthodox churches are not as wealthy as the Catholic churches. They're not going to be able to stand billions of dollars worth of, of settlements. Um, and so they should be more, be more concerned about removing these people. You know, um, if you think they still have, you know, good for them, put them in a remote monastery. Don't allow any visitors to a monastery and use them that way. But don't put them in parishes with unsuspecting parents and with vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. Now, wrapping up here, like you, you've mentioned, like, um, obviously you, you can't, you only speak English. Like, um, how what was it? And we, there really isn't like any data, unfortunately, about like, um, about issues of abuse, maybe in like, countries with like larger um, Orthodox populations like Russia, Serbia, Greece, like ha to your knowledge, like has like SNAP, like maybe like try to like um, expand, like um, like maybe try to reach, maybe I don't know, like opening up for example, like um, like a Greek website or a Russian website, like to 
reach out to potential survivors there or try to reach out to a like organization with uh, similar missions like um in those countries not real as again you know because snap is an american organization and we overall have the same problem that there aren't very many people who speak foreign languages we do have um right now in in Europe, we uh, SNAP has a leader who speaks French, um, and we have a leader who is fluent. And I just looked at it a few not long ago, but she like speaks uh, Croatian and uh, some of the uh, Serbian. And I, there was something else she men mentioned, uh, and English. So we have her in in that part of the country, but we have to have the people come come forward to us. You know, we haven't really had. Um, I mean, when I had my web website, there used to be people from Greece who would send me, you know, um, news articles about things that were going on in Greece. Um, um, and I would, you know, I have to say, you know, um, you're going to have to give me a synopsis of it, um, or you, you know, find something in English on the same topic, because I, you know, I don't like to put something on the website that I don't really understand. And while Spanish to English, Google, you know, Google Translate is not too bad. Spanish to English, um, I found when you put things that are in Russian or Greek, you get some things like, what? Um, what? <laughs> what is that person trying to say? So we really need people who speak those languages in order to have an effective um, outreach in those countries. And we don't have that yet. I mean, thankfully, a lot of people speak English. And um, so, you know, there is that that our resources and we try to try to have them but snap like um our old website just we just didn't have we just don't have the capacity to translate um if people don't speak english you know snap now does have um, the other thing it has of course spanish we have a couple leaders that um, three leaders offhand i can think of offhand that speak spanish but um, even that mission is 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 compromised because a lot of our leaders don't speak Spanish, um, um, and we you know so we have a special a special outreach just to the Spanish speakers. You know, some people it doesn't matter they they're bilingual they speak Spanish and English. Um, other people, particularly some of the newer immigrants, you know, they're not fluent in English, um, but we do have. Um, some for that, you know, maybe someday we'll have, I think the other big need at least is probably um, from the Philippines or from uh, Vietnam. But, you know, we do what we can when we can. And, uh, you know, as I said, thank goodness, a lot of people in the world speak English now. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, like one day, like um, we can see like maybe like an expansion like into like other parts of the world, like uh, to address this problem. But this has been an awesome conversation. I truly appreciate it, Melody. Thank you so much for your insight. Um, I truly do appreciate taking the time out of your day for this. Oh well, I thank you for doing it. And you know, when you get the link, let me know, and uh, we'll 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 spread it around. Yeah, Bob, I definitely do plan to share share it around. All right, so, but thank you so much. I, I, I had an awesome time talking to you. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Have a right. good rest of your day and don't get COVID. No. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.